Welcome to the Leo Training Podcast with Joe DeLeo. You'll hear in-depth interviews and tips from world-class athletes, coaches, and industry-leading experts to help you train smarter and improve at what you love to do. Train smarter, get stronger, move better, race faster. Here's your host, Joe DeLeo. Hi, everyone. We're back after a one-week hiatus. This week's guest is trainer Kevin Rail, who is based out of Utah. Kevin has a wealth of knowledge and experience in training and coaching. Here are three things that you will learn in this interview. One, the importance of movement quality preceding volume and intensity. Two, integrating the restorative arts such as Indian clubs, and the mace into your training and how it can improve your posture and balance. And three, Kevin's work on the documentary film, The Motivation Factor, and what our present society can learn from La Sierra High School's physical fitness program of the 1960s. And finally, before we begin this episode, I have a few quick announcements. Please stay tuned for my upcoming winter training online program for rowers that I will be announcing via my Instagram and Facebook pages. This will be a three-month program focused on improving fitness and preparation on the ergometer, as well as building strength, power, and injury resilience. If you enjoyed this free content, please consider giving back in the following ways. One, you can make a small donation on my Patreon page. Donations help me to grow this show and allow me to expand the type of content I can offer you, the audience. So in short, these donations will be reinvested to make higher quality content to help you on your training journey. Second, you can leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. The reviews on Apple Podcasts are actually critical to show growth. A five-star review places me higher in the search rankings on Apple Podcasts and makes me more visible to those looking for similar content when they search for something regarding strength and conditioning or health and fitness. So if you find this content valuable and it's something that has helped benefit you in your journey and training, please take a moment, drop a five-star review, and help me out. Without further ado, let's roll to this episode with Kevin Rail. Thank you for listening and have a great week. All right, listeners, we're back with another brand new interview for the Leo Training Podcast. Uh, very excited. My guest uh, this morning is a uh, fellow SFG. Uh, Kevin Rail. Kevin's coming to us from Utah, right? That's right. Park City, baby. Awesome. Welcome to the show, man. Thanks for coming on. Thank you. I really appreciate um, the. It's actually an honor to be talking to you today because I respect um, so many people in the field of health and wellness, and you're definitely on that list. And um, when you asked me to be on the show, I was super excited and ecstatic. So I can't wait to chat with you about about things in life. Me too, man. And thank you very much. I appreciate that. That's uh. It's always great to hear and get that kind of feedback, so I appreciate you uh, listening and supporting the show and everything. Let's start off. Let's talk about uh, kind of your journey, your, your personal history, um, kind of roots of coaching, um, you know, what have been your influences, uh, whether that's been, you know, historical or certain individuals and stuff, and kind of bring us up to speed of what you're currently doing, please. Okay. Well, I'll try, to, I'll try to keep this as brief as I can, but it's not always easy. I was actually, uh, I grew up in uh, Northeast Pennsylvania, and I was touched at a very young age by physical culture. I'm going to call it that. Um, my father was in the Army, and he was, um, he was a little bit old-fashioned. And when me and my brother were growing up, he was always on our asses about, he didn't want us to get fat, he didn't want us to get out of shape, he didn't want us to have pot bellies, he didn't want us to be lazy. So he forced us to go outside and pick rocks in the garden and weed the garden and cut the grass and trim the trees and all this crap while the rest of our friends all had like Atari 2600 and they were playing with their GoBots. <laughs> we were outside doing chores, gritting our teeth and angry as can be. And I, I, I detested my dad for so many years because of that. And actually, as I look back in hindsight, it was probably the best thing that ever could have happened to me, getting my ass whipped at a young age because it instilled a um, killer instinct in me uh, of just general fitness and, and physical activity. And um, I was kind of in that, I was on the edge of where the technology age started to kick in. And I started, I saw it, but I didn't really jump into it because I was too busy loving the outdoors and mother nature. And I'm a huge fan of 
ecotherapy and being outside and connecting with the universe because I feel we're all just like so connected. It's unbelievable. Uh, every human being and just like all of the grass and the trees and the leaves and everything you see out there, it's all just like this big pool of energy. And I just throw myself out into it every single day, any chance I can. And it just, it just connected at a young age. You know, I feel without sounding egotistical, I feel like I'm a visionary. And I think there's like a greater purpose for, for all of us here. But I think whatever we contribute outward to the universe and to this pool of energy that circles around us, we're going to get back in return um, 10,000 times. So I literally started thinking about this at a young age. And as I got older, it started to make a lot more sense when I, when I would do good things for people for no reason and I would get good things in return. It just kind of like clicked to me that that's the way to live life. And then as I got older, I started reading stuff from like um, uh, Dr. Wayne Dyer and uh, Napoleon Hill and all these people. And I realized that there was actually like this thing out there that they call quantum physics or like the power of now or the energy or, uh, you know, the secret was a big thing that came out in the early 2000s. And that really connected a lot of dots for me that what I was doing was the right thing all along. And I didn't really put any thought into it. Um, so then I started getting into, you know, I, I stayed into exercise my whole life, but it wasn't until like my mid twenties that I really connected the dots between fusing exercise and nutrition together. And that then became my passion. Um, it, along with, trying to do the best I can for everybody else at the same time and bring them along with me on the ride. And it became apparent to me that I needed to step into the fitness sector as, as a career. <clears throat> when I was helping people out a lot of times just for the hell of it because I liked it and it made me feel good, it made them feel good, and I saw the high that they were getting and I was getting that reciprocating high in return greater than any alcohol or drug or chocolate bar could ever give you. So you probably, this sounds familiar to you. I see you smiling. You probably, you probably know kind of what I'm talking about. And it's like, the the feeling that you get from working with people and connecting with them it's like a human connection is a good way to put it is second to none in my opinion in the world and i just got done with a class before i came here and i had like a, a ton of people came this morning i had like 11 people in a small area and everybody was happy everybody was giving it their all and everyone's doing great and it just the feedback you get is just amazing so i knew that i had to get into that whole pipeline and do it as a lifetime choice and career and then i shifted gears into that completely in my um, late 20s and I've been there ever since. And the, the evolution kind of, you know, when I first started out, you know, it's always like as you, when you first start out as a trainer or you go through college or whatever, you're indoctrinated to believe this like three sets of 10 and hypertrophy and you learn all these fancy terms and everything. But in reality, I don't really give a damn about how many acronyms are past your name, how many syllables are past your name, how many years you spend in school. What can you, what can you give me that's going to help me? What's going to change me? What's going to make me a better person? And can you do that in a way that's non-egotistical? Because there's so many people in the market, in the, in the fitness industry, that are absolute egomaniacs. It drives me crazy. I can't stand it. And I try to live my life as free of ego as possible every waking hour. And I always check in with myself. And I'm like, wait, did I, did I go too far? Or did I like, display uh, any kind of mannerisms that were like egoic or something like that? So I always check in with myself. And I try to stop it instantly. And I say, like, okay, I'm good. And then I move forward. So I wanted to change the game. As I, got, as I get older, I, I keep feeling I get in better shape as I age, and I get in better physical and mental shape as well, and I feel like I, I produce um, exercise protocols and programs better and better each day, and it's because I keep dropping the ego, and I keep coming right back down to, to the balance point, and I keep coming down to Mother Nature in the end and start from the ground up, and I say, well, I can teach this person how to do three sets of 12 bench presses with a barbell. But they can also go to YouTube and, and do that on their own so fast and easy. It's not even funny in a split second. And they're paying me harder and money to teach them basic, stupid, irrelevant stuff that really isn't going to help them in real life. Now, when someone comes to me and they are hardcore um, you know, marathon runners or they're, they're ex-terror racers through the mountains, through the woods, and they have to carry backpacks with them, or they're bikers or they're ski, skiers or snowboarders or ice skaters or whatever, and they have all these passions outside the gym. I ask them questions before I train them. And I'm like, what is it that you do outside the gym? And as soon as you ask someone a question, an open-ended question like that, they get excited and their eyes light up and their smile comes on their face. People love to talk about themselves and people love to tell you about what they're doing. It just makes them excited. So I could care less about how much they can bench press or squat or deadlift. I want to know what they do outside the gym and how can I make that person excel at the things they love to do that fires them up. And I recognize it by the twinkle in their eye when I interview them. And when they tell me all these battery of things they do outside the gym, I say, great, let's go to work. I do some quick assessments. I find out where they're lacking, it, whether it be balance, whether it be flexibility, whether it be left arm stronger than the other, if their left shoulder's tipped to the right, if they're um, unable to hold a plank for X amount of seconds, if the core is weak, if their back is arching. 
And then I just go to work and I start nitpicking out these little spots and I do it in a magic way that they don't even know that I'm, I'm helping them or curing them. So as I went through all of my, my schooling and my certifications and all that stuff, I came upon Strong First several years ago. I got my hands on some kettlebells and they blew my socks off. And to this day, I still love them and they're in, absolute integral tools in my, in my workout and my training programs. And I can't say enough about kettlebells. If you want like a one-stop shop, complete body transformation tool, nothing compares to a kettlebell in my opinion. Nothing. Um, I utilize them basically six days a week. Uh, and I use them with me. I use them with my clients. I use them in my classes. I use them in my training sessions. I do seminars and workshops on them. And that's what, that's what really changed my, my game several years back when I started digging into those babies. And since then to now, I've, I've kind of defined, I've, I've, created a style of training i feel that's that's 100 against the grain um if you ever trained with me you you would be you'd have kettlebells in your hands you'd be doing bodyweight exercises with your eyes wide open trying to remember what I'm, i i showed you because everything i do is complex and is three-dimensional and it has a different type of connotation to it that that challenges all of your weaknesses rolled into one and at the same time it improves your flexibility and your balance and your brain function and your core strength and your lean muscle mass all together so basically what I feel I've done is I've created protocols and workout programs that help create a superhuman. So it's going to give you all those things I just mentioned, plus increase, improve your posture and make you more resilient to injury and correct injuries faster than you ever did before. And that took years of practice and years of, you know, deciding to go against the grain and years of like famine, because I, I know you've probably been down the famine road too. As, as a trainer, it's always feast or famine for several years at least. And I didn't care because I didn't want to be another face on the wall at the gym of, of a trainer who just shows people how to do three sets of 10 and just collects a paycheck every week with my arms full. They've show, shown someone how to sit on a machine and push a lever back and forth. And so many trainers across the globe do that these days. It, it makes me sad. It doesn't necessarily bring a tear to my eye. It just like, it makes me sad that they're raping so many people of hard earned cash, making a big paycheck and doing such basic elementary things that aren't really going to help people in real life and the game of life. So I just gave you a really long story, and I apologize for that, <laughs> but that's kind of the situation. So to, to bottom line it, yeah, I started out with the, the schooling of like the three sets of 10 and take this much rest recovery and have someone do a step-up test and blah, blah, blah. But in real life, I just get right down to the business when I meet people, and I get right to the heart of the matter, and I want people to move better. I want people to think better. I want them to be more resilient to injury, and I want them to rehab from any injuries they may already have that they don't know they have or that they do in a way that's going to be non-threatening to them and they're going to enjoy at the same time. So it's all about finding the sweet spot for everybody. And that is exactly where I've gone to. And I'm actually loving it right here at this spot. And just for the record, um, my, uh, sir, my strong first certification ended at the end of August and I didn't recertify for a number of reasons. And it has nothing to do with, um, I can't stand strong first or I have a gripe on anybody or anything like that. It's just purely, um, it was my decision to not recertify. I've been certified for four and a half years and I have, um, some other things I'm working on right now that, that need, need my attention more than that did. And I feel that I have the, the skills and knowledge to, you know, continually use the kettlebell confidently and train people how to use it properly as well. And I do a couple things with it that are different than the average person as well. So that's pretty much my story right there. All in a nutshell. Cool, man. Thank you for sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it uh, sounds like uh, you've had some very diverse, eclectic experiences that have uh, shaped shaped your life. Yeah, totally. So um, you kind of touched on uh, your, your philosophy and approach to training and stuff, and really kind of getting to the core of uh, you know what what is it that you can help that particular person that you're working with. Um, yeah. So. Why don't you kind of dive a little bit deeper and go into some of the other different modalities that you use? Uh, so you mentioned mm -hmm. kettlebells, but but I know that's not the only um, tool or piece of equipment that you use. Uh, and then how you kind of integrate all those different tools uh, into mm -hmm. the training. Cool. So another thing that I'm huge into is the study of fitness, if you will, um, also known as the history of fitness. Mm -hmm. Years and years ago, people were, they trained a lot differently. They, they were really straight. They had really good posture. They were lean. They were muscular, but they weren't too muscular. They were fast. They were agile. They were mobile. And what they did differently is they would spend 
two to three hours a day practicing things. They wouldn't call it exercise. They didn't say, I'm going to the gym to work out. They would go to a YMCA in the late 1800s during the golden era of fitness between 1880 and 1920, and they would practice things for hours. And there would be one person standing around spotting another person while they hung from ropes or rings or monkey bars or some kind of weird shaped ladders, and they practiced all these drills. And then they would take out their, their tools, their historical training tools, as we call them now, but back then they were just common things, which would be Indian clubs, wands, medicine balls, kettlebells, um, meals, maces, all these different things. The mace and the meal were kind of like um, more so out in like Persia and stuff like that. They kind of just became a thing, if you will, in America recently, the mace especially. Um, but now I integrate all these tools every single day. Like when I go to the gym, I will have, it'll just look like a garage sale is going on, a fitness garage sale. I'll have kettlebells in one spot. I have a mace. I have a couple different pair of Indian clubs, different sizes. I have a meal. And sometimes I'll bring out two maces. I have these double ball staffs and I have like one pound eating clubs and it's just like scattered all over the gym. So I'll go to like one thing to the next. So I'll do like a, a kettlebell drill, such as a grind. I do like uh, some things off balance, like a three point plank press, which I really like. And then I'll put it down and I'll just immediately stand up and I'll pick up my mace and I'll, I'll do like 10, 360s each direction. Then I'll put it down. Then I'll go grab two kettlebells and do like double swings. Then I'll come back and I'll grab my eating clubs and I'll do 20 half hearts on the front and 20 reverse ones. Then I'll go back and grab one kettlebell and do, say, clean presses. And then I'll come back and grab my double ball staffs and I'll spin those. So basically what I do is I bounce back and forth integrating these tools into my workouts. And what I feel that has happened is, like I was telling you before, I feel like I keep getting into better shape. And it's, the reason why is because I keep developing new, new skills. I keep practicing them and I see how I can fit them into my workouts. And it just creates an amazing feedback on your body that not only makes you leaner and more defined, but also it makes you feel better. And I always say when you get to the gym, you should have at least a, a small idea of what you want to achieve when you get there, if not a huge idea. Yeah. And you should always feel better when you leave than when you got there, both phys physically and mentally. And integrating these restorative arts tools into my work makes me feel absolutely amazing. Like my shoulders just feel amazing the rest of the day. Strong, loose, um, and just pulled back. And I feel like my posture is really good. So when you start feeling the benefits that these tools can bring to you, it's hard to not use them every day. And why wouldn't you want to use them? And you can use them every day. It's not like doing max, you know, um, maxing out squats or something like that. And you should only do it like once a week or twice a week. The fun part about the Indian, the Indian clubs and the restorative arts tools and you can, is you can use these every day, kind of like a yoga practice. And it's all based on circles, spirals, and figure eights. So when you start integrating these movement patterns into your workouts, they've re they develop this different type of strength at the connective tissue, the deep level of your joints that nothing else out there can do. This is what I've, I've figured out over the years. And it brings oxygenated blood flow to your joints, which is very healing in a way that nothing else can do. Better than a resistance band does with like an external rotation or internal rotation, which often is prescribed for people with rotator cuff issues. And these movements just feel so much better too, physically and mentally. And every time you cross the midline of your body, which you do often, you fire up a, a zillion neurotransmitters in your brain so your brain function goes through the roof in essence it's like they always tell you as you get older make sure to do crossword puzzles and make sure to read and make sure to write and go on sit on your computer and do luminosity or some whatever that stupid idiot stuff is or look look through crossword puzzles to keep your brain sharp and i'm like well that's great but the problem isn't necessarily keeping your brain sharp it's the, the problem that we have is we don't move enough so telling someone to sit down and do a crossword puzzle or whatever it is is just like it's a recipe for disaster, in my opinion. It's, it's going to spark a little bit of brain function, maybe. But if you have them go out in the grass and roll around and do a, a complex movement pattern where they stand on one foot and they do a hand walk and they kick their leg under and they roll over and they stand back up and come back down, they got to think about so many things, so many moving parts. Where are my hands? Where are my feet? What leg is in the air? What rep number am I on? Um, I need to spin which way? I need to keep my hips how high? So your brain is just like constantly firing and firing and firing. And if you do it in bare feet and you're in the grass, then you're, you're earthing too. So you're getting negative ions from the earth. So it all shoots into your body. It improves your mood and it helps your brain function better than anything else in the world. So that is kind of the way that I approach fitness 100% these days. And that's how I train myself and that's how I train people. And I slowly integrate my tools in with people as well. And those who I have used them absolutely love them. So that kind of explains it right there, I think. Yeah. So... Uh, I guess the only question I would have for you then is like, so if, say you're starting off with somebody kind of brand new that doesn't really have a background with using all those different 
tools. Yeah. Uh, kind of how do you kind of bring them up to speed? Because obviously at the beginning, you're going to be taking a little bit more time and teaching them and stuff. So they're not going to be able to kind of move from uh, station to station, so to speak. Right, exactly. So I, 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 it's one piece at a time and it's very slow progress. Sometimes I'll have someone doing Indian clubs, one pounders for weeks at a time before we even go any farther. It's, you got to break it down into really small pieces. That's how I do it. So oftentimes I'll have a session with someone and then at the last 15 minutes, I'll put an Indian club in their hand and I'll get them, I'll just get their brain going a little bit. I'll be like, we're going to do some Indian clubs to finish up with. Okay, cool. I'll give them a quick briefing and say, these are classical training tools that we used 200 years ago. And they're really good for your wrist, your elbow, your shoulder range of motion and flexibility. And they're also good for posture and brain function too. And usually that sales pitch right there has people go like this and their eyes get wide open. And then all of a sudden, they, they always throw this at me and say, oh, my shoulder is really sticky or my shoulder is sore. Or, I, I injured my shoulder years ago. I had a rotator cuff. Most people in my town, I live in a uh, resort town here. Everyone's a hardcore athlete. Some people are former professional athletes or, or close to that level. Everybody has an injury, and most people have a shoulder issue. So when I start telling them it's really beneficial for the shoulder, they're like, oh, that sounds great because I've been going for PT because of this uh, frozen shoulder syndrome I have. I'm like, great. So then I put an Indian club in their hand, and I literally show them like half of a pattern. And I'm like, let's start right here. And then we go, and we just break it down into very small pieces. And then every single session, we just keep adding to it. And to the point where they're able to do a full, nice, graceful, heart-shaped front and back circle. And then eventually they use two clubs. And then we start just branching off the patterns as they go along. Mm-hmm. And then I'll move them to the next tool. So I'll say, let's, let's start working on the mace. And I have, I've got a few maces. And one is like relatively light. It's like 9 or 10 pounds. And then I've got a couple that are heavier, like 25, 30. And of course, no one touches that thing until they earn it. And, um, I basically will show them the basics there. Then we start working on the more advanced stuff. And, and we start from, I always say, start from the ground up. Everything starts that way. And when I, when I say that, yes, uh, it does kind of mean, you know, from the feet upward, but it also means you're starting out at rock bottom and working your way up. And I always tell you people, you have to earn your way up. I don't have to say, let's do this this week. And then next week we're doing this. Week we're going to do deadlifts and kettlebell. Next week we're doing snatches. It's like, I don't force my hand on anyone about their learning curve or how long it takes them to get somewhere because I don't like that being done to me. And I treat everyone like I would like to be treated. So I'm like, I take as much time as it needs to be, needs to be taken with people for them to progress. So if, if they're only able to use one Indian club and do a heart-shaped circle for weeks and weeks and weeks, and that's totally fine by me. When, they feel, when I feel they're ready to go and they feel comfortable or confident where they are, then I progress them forward. And then we just gradually build our way up. So that's how it works. Excellent. Um, you, you touched on another topic we had down there, which was kind of, uh, you know, the, the feet and barefoot training and stuff. So let's kind of just segue into that and why it's kind of important, uh, as you said, to work from the, the ground up. Well, everything, anything from a standing position, it makes so much sense to me to have your foot as bare as possible or as close to the ground as possible in a way that you can also spread your toes. Um, Any yoga class you go to across the world, people will be in bare feet. Bare feet were invented before shoes, and the progression of shoes were no shoes and then thin moccasins, if you will, I believe, were the Indians and the Incas and stuff back in a long, long time ago. And then eventually it was like a thicker padding, thicker padding, thicker padding. Then the 70s came, and even as recent as like the 50s and 60s, you would look at if you look at classical pictures of boys in gym, basketball teams, they would have um, Converse high tops on, flat soles. And that was the deal. There was no sponge. There was no fluff. There was no gel. There was no honeycomb on the bottom of the shoe. There was no nothing. By the time I got into high school, all these fancy shoes started coming out. There was gel Asics and Nike Airs and Nike um, pump ups and all these other things where you could pump air into your shoe and all this crap. That basically what happened was the shoe industry ruined the barefoot industry, in my opinion, back in the 70s when, when greed started taking over and they saw, they saw dollars, marketing dollars. Um, they, wanted to make, they wanted to make it easier for you to pound your joints into oblivion by protecting your feet and your, and your heels. So that was a masterful job they did with, with all those padded, spongy shoes. But in reality, when you wear those shoes, your, the toe box, which is the front of the shoe, is narrower than it should be, and it causes your toes to get cramped up. So they can't spread and the muscles in your feet get get atrophied. So they're not able to work the way they're supposed to, the way they're supposed to design to. 
And in doing so, um, a lot of people actually start developing bunions because their, their, their big toes get pushed inward too much and too long. And women especially are, are in danger of that happening because they wear high heels and stuff. High heels look good, don't get me wrong. But if you wear high heels, you should always compensate by walking around barefoot as much as possible too or, or choosing a minimal shoe. Um, and then you have the, the biggest factor is your heel is elevated probably one to one and a half inches from the ground and your foot is kind of pitched forward. So what's going to happen when you wear these thick spongy shoes is your calves are going to be conditioned to be shorter than they should be because your heel is always elevated through the day. So your muscle adapts to that length. So that is problem number one. The second problem and a huge one is that your heel is pitched up and it's like you're standing on a sponge all day long. So how can you possibly get good ground force production? When you're doing any kind of exercise, regardless if it's a kettlebell swing or snatch or anything like that, just anything in general, if you're hoisting a, like a barbell over your head or a dumbbell and your feet are on those sponges, it's just so, it's so uneven. So anytime you do that, um, it, sends, it transfers force to your joints in a lateral motion. If you're just walking, that happens. If you're lifting weights, it happens. And it happens even more when you're running. So people falsely think that they can wear these big, thick, spongy shoes like those Hocus, for example. I can't stand them. And yes, I'm calling them out because whatever. Anybody who knows me knows I, I, don't, I don't pull punches. Let's just call a spade a spade. That's just one of the companies out there. They have these big, thick soles. And they're like, oh, they're the best shoe for running and blah, blah, blah. Well, I beg to differ. When your foot is that high off the ground, how can you possibly get a good force production when you're hitting the ground? When you're running, the front of your foot should be hitting first, not your heel, first of all. So when you have that big sponge, it gives you the false sense of security that you could just keep pounding your heel into the ground. And that's what all the shoe companies want you to believe. Oh, no, no stress to your feet, no stress to your joints. And yeah, it's going to feel like you're, you're running on pillows. But the problem is every time your foot strikes the ground, you have a slight bit of, of twisting going on with your ankle. So anytime that twist happens, it sends um, stress through your whole kinetic chain all the way up to your neck. And you don't even realize it until your IT bands start getting really tight and your knees start hurting and your hip starts hurting and your lower back starts hurting, your neck starts hurting. And it all just kind of accumulates from there after running for years and years. And you're like, oh my God, why do I have all this pain? I got these gray shoes on, all the stick sponge on the bottom. And that's exactly why right there. So I started realizing this about a decade ago, that this was just a big hoax and a big bunch of fluff. So I transferred over to flat sole shoes first, which would be your Converse All-Stars or your Vans or um, Airwalks or anything cool like that. Because the skaters know that when they're on their skateboard, they don't want that big sponge on their foot. They want a flat sole. So the shoe companies in those departments are legit and they're cool. And they're the ones that I like. So I started wearing those. I learned how to run with a forefoot strike. And then I started getting thinner and thinner soles until I got to the point where I had, um, I was going to get even five fingers, but my toes don't fit in those compartments well because so they, they drive me. So they drove me crazy and I didn't buy those. I got these pair of shoes called Sockwas, which I really like. They're like slippers, but yeah. they have a one millimeter. Have you heard of Sockwas? Yes. Yeah, they're pretty cool. So when I go into buildings, I got to wear those. Because I can't, I'm not allowed to be barefoot. And when I work out at the gym that I work out of, I wear those in there when I'm working out. And sometimes in the summer when it's hot, I'm still training people with my sock was on. And it's little, literally a millimeter. It feels like you're barefoot, but you have like this one little thing on the bottom. And those are great as far as minimalists go. But when it comes to outside, I literally, during the summer, I only wear shoes if I absolutely have to. I'm barefoot indoors. I'm barefoot outdoors. I drive barefoot and I bring shoes with me. I'll bring a, a pair of... Um, Flip flops with me. I'm, if I'm going to like Whole Foods or something like that, I'll throw them on. I'll go in the store. I'll come back outside. I'll take them off. And I despise the idea of even having shoes on. And, and because it's Park City, Utah here, and I'm in the Rocky Mountains, 7,000 foot ver um, elevation, we have massive winters here. In fact, we got a ton of snow last weekend. So, of course, I got to wear shoes in the winter. But I still have, you know, in the gym, I wear my vans. I wear flat soles when I'm training people and teaching people things. And I try to get everyone I train to engage as well in the methodology of the barefoot or the minimalist shoe. Um, some of them comply and some of them don't. And I'm like, okay, it's cool. But as long as they, you know, when I start training people on kettlebells, I don't even have them touch a kettlebell until about, uh, I give them about a 15 minute speech on foot fitness and why they should go barefoot or they should go flat sole. And they're all just like uh, eyes and ears open because nobody talks about this stuff and no one knows about it except, you know, so several of us in the fitness industry who know the deal behind it. And like Emily Spiegel is a, She's a barefoot fitness person too. Yep. And uh, um, I've, I've studied some of her work and she's really amazing. And I love when I hear other people talk about it. It just fires me up because it's, it's, it's legit and it's real deal. And it's like these little things are what we neglect most because everybody wants to have the magic pill or the magic bullet or they want the big chest and the, the you know, ripped arms and all that stuff. But there's so many safer ways and better ways to get to that point. 
that I feel it's our duty that do know this stuff to get this information out there and to get people fired up and get them on board. Plus, you have earthing and grounding, which is basically the same thing as synonymous. When you're out on the grass, barefoot, or you get any of your body parts close to the ground, um, it takes approximately 30 seconds, I believe, to walk across your yard and back. If you go across your yard and back barefooted, your body's going to collect negative ions and your, all your systems are going to go into homeostasis, which means everything is going to balance out to a T. So in a, minim a minimum of 30 seconds, that's going to happen. So when you run barefoot and you connect with the ground for like 30 minutes or 40 or whatever, you can just multiply that times 1,000. So you're getting all these negative ions shot into your feet over and over again. Plus, there are pressure points in the bottom of your feet. If you study reflexology at all, every single nerve transfers to another part of your body. So I've done research and found out that there's a pressure point right at the center of the forefoot that if you hit it over and over again, it helps reduce your risk for cardiovascular disease. So hopefully that's never going to happen to me because I do run barefoot and I walk around that way all the time. So all those benefits right there are the reason why I go barefoot. And that's why I engage and uh, uh, I invite everyone else to do the same thing as much as they can too. Yeah, and you're, most kettlebell people I know are barefooters, so you probably are as well. Yeah, I've done both. I've run, uh, I've done some training runs barefoot and then, come on, chat bear. <laughs> I've done some training runs barefoot as well as, um, have run in, uh, Vibram's, uh, five fingers. And then, uh, also I just recently purchased, um, some of the, uh, pair of the, uh, zero brand shoes, which is like, yeah, a, I've got a pair of those. Yeah. yeah I like those. Um, I got the, the Prio, which is like uh -huh. the shoe, um, but it has a much wider toe box. So it allows all your, your toes to kind of uh, play out the way that they're supposed to naturally. Um, and the reason that I kind of moved to them from the five fingers was that I really enjoyed the feedback I got from the five fingers. But what I found was that my foot would actually fatigue faster than my legs or my cardiovascular system um just from kind of the the um you know impact over harder surfaces when running so the zero shoe is great it gives me that barefoot feel but at the same time i've got a little bit more protection between like you know the ground or rocks or anything like that but still getting all that proprioceptive feedback so it's been a really nice transition cool yeah man yeah, I've got a pair of those zero shoes. The this they're like a it's more like a sandal. Yes, and they're you can still run with them, but they're very cool. They're lightweight, and I yep. like them. Yeah, I like them. I couldn't believe when I picked them up how um, how light uh, and flexible the entire shoe was. Yeah, um, but also like just the, the the comfort level was extremely high, and um, just just a you know very well made product. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um what was I gonna say? Uh so two two other topics we had down there was you you wanted to discuss uh kind of specific abdominal work. Yeah. And then and then we can go into nutrition and then we'll we'll uh, kind of round things out with the motivation factor project. Cool, sounds good. I love talking about the abs because it's one of my bread and butters. Um uh, and it's something that I've worked on for years. I've studied for years. The good, the right, the bad, the ugly, everything. I've seen it come and go. I've seen all the hacks out there promoting every program in the world, every trick in the book, and every lick in the book. And here's my take on it. The basic stuff, the crunches, the planks, those stupid, ridiculous machines at the gym where you line your back and you go the ab machines and all that, it is so, they are so worthless, it's not even funny in my opinion. I understand... You know, yeah, anatomy states that if you, if you flex the spine, you're going to contract this part of the abs, whatever, blah, blah, blah. But there's such a greater world out there of ways that are so much more fun and so much more intriguing to work your abs and work your core that it's not even funny. So every single thing that I do with it, it's rarely, I don't think I, in my history of my training career, have I ever had anyone lie on their back, bend their knees, and literally do crunches and say, okay, now tuck your chin in and just come up right here and do 20 of these or sit on a ball and do crunches. I mean, time and place, fine. If you do that stuff, it's up to you. It's your prerogative. But for me, I like to challenge the core in a way that's 10 times greater and, and a lot more fun and a lot more beneficial for the body as a whole. So if you just take the kettlebell, for example, let's just talk about Turkish get-ups. 
If you want to get a six pack, don't waste your time with crunches. Don't waste your time with lying on your back and pulling your knees in and doing reverse knee pull ins or leg raises. Get yourself on a kettlebell. Learn how to do a Turkish get up with pre precision and do about 20 of those in a row three times a week and watch what happens to your body. Not your abs, your body. Your abs are going to be solid as a rock. Your body is going to be solid as a rock. One exercise, one drill. Because what you're doing is you're creating tension and you're holding that tension for a long time. So in order to build uh, definition in your stomach, obviously you got to burn the fat off. That's one thing. So you got to watch your diet and you got to do different tricks with uh, manipulations with uh, cardio or whatever. But also you got to build, you got to create tension in your stomach. You get tension by doing cool exercises such as Turkish get-ups and snatches and anything hanging from a pull-up bar. Off the ground training, amazing. Skin the cats, leg raises, windshield wipers, pull-ups, chin-ups, um, ice cream makers, front levers, back levers, you name it. Anything from a pull-up bar, you just spend your time doing that stuff, your, your abs are going to be so defined and something funny. And not just that, but your whole body is going to be. And your posture is going to be better. So you need to ask yourself, how can I obtain good abdominal strength and definition in a way that's going to help me throughout my whole entire body? And how, how can I do that by creating tension? So tension is the key thing. It, it, it just trumps everything. So when you're doing crawling, like I don't know if you saw my video the other day, I was crawling out in the snow. That's like 100%. Your abs are like contracted the whole time you crawl. So if you crawl from like one side of a room to another, or if you're in a gym and go from one side to the other and it's 50 yards long and you crawl all the way down, all the way back, it would be the equivalent of doing probably a thousand crunches, except it's more fun. It's way better for your body. It's going to help your posture. It's going to also work your chest and your arms and your shoulders and your quads all at the same time. And your abs are still going to get a focus work as well. So that is the fun way to work your abs. And that's the way that I do it. And that's the way I instruct it to people. And that's how I teach them. And the class that I did this morning, I, I, throughout the year, I periodically do this six pack challenge, it's called. And I do it in live format at the gym. And I also have, the, I have an online version of that as well that you can do at home for people. And my six pack challenge, it's called my six pack challenge, actually, the home version. It's not like your, your typical ab workout where, all right, let's ladder back and we're going to do 50 crunches. Ready, go. All right, now let's move our legs to the side. Let's do 50 more. Now let's do 50 more. Now let's hold the plank. Now let's lie on our back and we're going to raise our legs. I see some of these hacks on, on YouTube. 1.2 million views, 10 million views over and over again. And it's all just like their sequencing is pathetic and horrible. The, the work is like 1% of the population can do what they're telling you to do because it's too intense. And that is just like, it drives me crazy when I see that. And what I try to do is go completely left of center and away from all that, that nonsense that people put out there. And I try to create product that is good and high quality for people to do for people that don't have access to a lot of things as well. I want people to move their bodies better. So I want to get them to move better and work their abs at the same time. How can I do that? This is how I can do it. I can have them stand on one foot, do a hand walk, hold a position, pull their knee to their elbow, push it back, hand walk back up, change legs, walk back down. So you have a ton of tension going on at once. And then you're getting mobility as well, and you're working your abs in a way that's at, at an awkward angle, off balance, if you will. So all those things, being in, in compromised positions, is going to recruit a lot more muscle fiber than a basic crunch is going to do. So that's how I try to wrap it all together, and that's what I do. Yeah. Yeah, I like the idea of doing uh, like a couple sessions a week of like lighter, high repetition Turkish get-ups. Oh, dude, yeah. Nothing hits a spot better than Turkish. Good set of Turkish get-ups. That's just money. Nice. Um, yeah. And the other thing you touched on that was really good there too was um, uh, just the importance of, uh, and we'll get into it more now, I guess, is you know nutrition. Uh, yeah. Because as much as you might be doing specific exercises that are going to strengthen your whole body and t tie everything together, you're not going to really have uh, – a visible six pack unless you have your, your diet, your nutrition dialed in Di diet is people say, Oh, diet is 80% of everything and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, that's not true. I would say it's probably 95% of everything or at least 90. The cleaner your diet is the le actually the less time you need to work out technically because you're going to have more strength and energy to go harder and go to more intense pace. And the more intense your workout is the shorter it needs to be. So if you want to do like, if you have 20 minutes and you want to do a snatch protocol where you do like 10 snatches on the right arm, 10 on the left arm, park it, shake it off, get the tension out, pick it back up in 30 seconds and just repeat for 20 minutes in a row, you're going to be destroyed. And that's all you're going to need, 20 minutes of that. However, you're not going to be able to perform at an optimal level if your diet is, is crap. It's that simple. And the bottom line is 
balance is key with everything in my opinion, including the diet. I'm not a fan of like cutting out whole food groups or like, oh, I want to lose weight, so I'm going to cut out carbs. I'm like, oh, great. You're going to cut out carbs. You're going to lose a few pounds in a couple of weeks, and then what's going to happen? You're going to want carbs back, and when you start eating them back, you're going to start eating, integrating them again. You're going to fall off the wagon because you've been so carb deprived, and you're going to eat a mass amount of them, and you're going to gain back the weight you lost, plus you're going to gain more, and then you're going to be frustrated, more frustrated than you were when you started. The best thing is God invented macronutrients for us years ago to eat, protein, carbs, and fat. When you're working out, depending on your intensity level, your body is either burning oxygen and fat for energy, or it's burning stored carbohydrates as glycogen, as it's known in the anatomy field. So when your intensity gets really high, your fat burning and oxygen level goes down, actually, and you start burning glucose, which is glycogen, for energy. That's called the anaerobic threshold when you cross it, when you're doing sprints. I did them this morning. And you're hyperventilating and you're huffing and puffing. You're not burning a lot of fat in the moment. You're burning more carbohydrates. Then when you come back down and your heart, starts, your heart rate starts coming back down, your fat burning starts going back up. And then you're able to intake oxygen more efficiently and utilize it for energy. So then your fat burning goes back up. Then when you crank your level back up and your heart rate starts going through the roof again, you start burning more glycogen. So interval training is the best because you go back and forth, back and forth in your workouts. Then you have the best of both worlds. Then you're burning an adequate amount of fat and you're tapping into your stored glycogen as well. When you tap into your stored glycogen, your metabolism gets boosted higher for a 24 to 48 hour period after you're done working out. So what I'm getting at is that is the optimal way to burn fat and to get lean muscle mass and the only way you can optimize your workouts is you're going to need energy from carbohydrates to do that. So in your off times, balance is best because you are going to need carbohydrates to get into those high levels. So don't eliminate them is my, what I'm getting at here. People just like to shove them to the side and say carbs are the devil. They're not the devil. What is the devil is what does not work for your body is the devil. So if you, if you eat like cottage cheese and you break out in hives and you have you know, your stomach feels like there's a bowling ball in it and it feels like an elephant is standing on your chest, you maybe shouldn't have dairy, okay? But if you can eat cottage cheese and your muscles feel solid as a rock and you feel energized, go for it. If you can eat gluten and you have no problems with it, go for it. If you can have sweet potatoes and they, they resonate well with you, eat them. If you eat them and you start breaking out in a rash and you, you gain five pounds at the end of the day, don't eat them. So basically, you've got to figure out what works for me and what doesn't work for me. Sure. And I've spent, you know, countless amount of years figuring this out and it's like it all comes down to common sense in the end once again we start from the ground up and we go back to mother nature mother nature put all this food out there for us to use and let's go utilize it and see what comes out of it i'm more concerned about where is the food coming from is it got artificial colors artificial flavors artificial sweeteners how processed was it hormones antibiotics who's been sticking their hands in my food making it grungy who's been putting artificial sweeteners in my in my squash that I bought at, over at, whole, at um, um, World Market last week, I need to know these things. That's what I want to know first. And then if the food is clean, I'll eat the food. It's that simple. And then my body needs fat, my body needs protein, my body needs carbs. And I know exactly how much I need of all those, and I eat it all the time. And that's what I suggest everybody else does too. Join the fray and have fun, and don't, don't be so restrictive that you can't indulge on life's bounties, such as food. Because we, we spend too much time listening to bad advice in the fitness industry and the nutrition industry, in my opinion. And one last thing about nutrition is I do um, time-restricted feeding and fasting as well. And I think that goes all the way back to history as well. There was a time where people grazed this earth and they, they had to hunt their food down. They had to chase it for sometimes hours and then to be exhausted. And they finally get a kill and then they, they would just eat like a whole entire animal. They're in their, them and their tribe or their family or whatever. And they wouldn't know when they were going to eat again after that. So they would go from feast to famine, feast to famine, by default, not by choice. However, nowadays, we tend to eat too much all the time. It's like everything we do revolves around food. Um, social gatherings, people are at work and are like, where are we going for lunch today? And then they go to a buffet. And then coming home at night, what are we going to have for lunch? What are we going to have to, for dinner? Oh, I'm going to stop by and get some pizza. Everything is like every single event has to do with food. If you can just restrict the time that you eat into a smaller window of time, that is a game changer. In my opinion, it doesn't matter if you follow a lactose-free diet, a vegan diet, a um, keto diet, Atkins diet, whatever it is, that's fine. But if you can fit your eating window into a smaller gap of the time you fast every single day. So for example, if you can fast for a minimum of 13 hours and then eat the rest of the hours of the day, just that little change right there, that small little change can change the game for you big time. It can put your 
all your body systems into perfect harmony. It can help with weight loss. It can help with brain function. It can help with everything. Like today, I, I, uh, right before I got on the phone with you, was the first time I ate all day since last night. So I went like thir 14 hours fasted before I just ate. So my window today is going to be like, whatever, nine to, nine to seven or something like that. Mm -hmm. So I'm big into that whole fasting thing. That's, that's just like, that is money in my opinion, more than, more than like cutting the carbs or anything like that. Basically, if you can eat between, say, 9 a.m. and 6 p.m., five days a week, then you're golden. That's like the golden window right there, 15 hours. Yeah, that's what I've started to do as well. Um, so it's just about 11.30 here. I haven't, I haven't eaten breakfast yet. I had coffee. But, oh, that's perfect. You know, so I think last night we had dinner around like 7 p.m. So, Oh, you're good. You're way up there. Yeah, yeah. yeah so I've been doing that, and sometimes you know, sometimes I'll do a run in the morning, or just sometimes a long walk in a fasted state. But same thing, I've noticed um, just better productivity, mental clarity, and stuff. And then I'll usually only eat probably instead of like three smaller meals, like two two larger meals. Like I'll have a breakfast with you know egg whites and eggs and some type of vegetable in there, and you know, fresh avocado or some locks maybe. Um, yeah. Sounds you know, good. so it's just a good, well-balanced, solid meal. And then I'll, I'll pretty much be good. You know, I'll get a training session in, in the afternoon then have dinner afterwards and be good. Yeah. That's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. The rule, the rule of thumb you should, you should aim for is don't necessarily eat less, but eat less often. That's the key thing to remember for people. Yeah, I mean, this past year has been an interesting journey, so I just, you know, um, it'll come out in a separate episode, but I, uh, you know, I attended the SFG2 this past weekend and stuff, so May 1st, I was 211 pounds, and I weighed in Saturday at 180.2. Oh my God, really? 30, it, 31 pounds. Since when, May? May 1st to, what is it, September 27th today when we're doing wow. So Saturday, so I wait, I mean, so Saturday I weighed in at 180, but this morning I woke up, I think it was 183. So, wow. so yeah, so, but I feel a lot better, um, much, much better, you know, less kind of achy inflammation in my joints when I, uh, wake up in the morning, um, much leaner energy levels are, are better. Now, you know, I will say that as I was getting down there and weight, I kind of had a period where I plateaued and I wasn't making any more strength gains because I was trying to get down to the weight I needed to be at for the half body weight press. But now that I've kind of been oh, okay. about three weeks now or so, it's stabilized and my body's kind of readjusted to that. Um, you know, and I can just now that the search over, I can just focus on the press that, that yeah. get in for uh, to submit a video for. Um, you know, I'm pretty confident my, my strength's going to come back pretty quickly. Um, but overall I feel much, much, much better. Uh huh. And you know, it's kind of, it's nice. You're saving also on the, the grocery bill too. Yeah. I, I, when I started, uh, getting serious about this, um, at, well, more recently I noticed there's a lot of stuff in my refrigerator that's starting to go bad. And I'm like, geez, I got to start, I got to either give this stuff away or I got to start figuring out where, when to eat it. Cause I'm like, I don't, I don't want to eat, you know, I have like my, my window and I'm like, eh, it's getting too late or, oh, it's too early. I can't eat yet. And some things are starting to grow funk and stuff in there Yep. in my refrigerator. So I'm like, ah, what am I going to do? Totally. Um, so <laughs> final topic, we got to make sure we touch on this. This is a really cool project you were a part of called the motivation factor project. Um, yeah which is actually a, a film documentary. So mm -hmm. why don't you kind of uh, take us through and explain what that is and sort of um, what individuals would be uh, learning about um, mm -hmm. by viewing the documentary and also make sure to you know, share where we can find it. Okay, so The Motivation Factor is a documentary film by Doug Orchard, who is a very talented film producer from California. And we became good friends over the past, I'd say, six years. And he came to me and said he was going to start working on this film about connecting the dots of the why behind exercise. And he also wanted to show what PE used to be like 
years ago and where it's come to nowadays, which is basically it's gone to nowhere. It's it's just it's down a dead end road. Um, back in the early '60s, there was this one PE program in America in Carmichael, California, called La Sierra High, and that PE program was looked at as a precedent by John F. Kennedy himself for all the rest of the PE programs across America to jump on board and follow the same kind of protocols that they were doing because these kids in this class were ripped to shreds and lean. And there was no judgment. There was no bullying. There was no anything going on like that. And the instructor's name was Coach Stan Laprati. And he developed this protocol for them to follow that was based on colors of shorts. So they would start at the blue level, which is the basic level. And they had to do a certain amount of exercises um, for a certain amount of reps to get to that level. And then it all just kind of increased from there. And then the color of their shorts changed. And he also made these different types of fitness apparatuses out in the back of the school that they would climb on and stuff. There was like pegboards and rope handles and these weird shaped dip bars and different things like that. And these kids were just in amazing shape. And there's all kinds of archival footage of that PE program in there. And then he kind of ties together what it was like back then and what it has come to now and how can we get it back to where it once was is the key thing. With a burgeoning obesity epidemics and all of the, the bullying, all the crap that's going on in the schools, he does a good job in showing how exercise and fitness can eliminate all that as well. In the fact that it creates community and unity with people. And that's one of the things that I talk about actually in the film is when I'm instructing classes and I start a new batch of six weeks or something, there'll be people that come in there that have never been there before. And I have all walks of life. I have people who are overweight. I have Black people, white people, Asian, women, men, young kids, um, thoroughbred athletes that were once on the U.S. ski team, and whatever. A whole batch of people. There's not one single person that judges anybody else or even looks over their shoulder at them. Within a matter of two or three classes, these people become really close and really good friends where they're out having lunch together and eventually like go to each other's houses for holidays, for family dinners, and they go on vacations and stuff, and they become really good friends. And it's all about the unity factor of how exercise can bring people together as opposed to pushing them apart, especially in nowadays when you see all this crap going on, protests and like finger pointing here and finger pointing there. It just, it's, it's numbing to see that happening. But exercise can bring people together. And that's a big point we talk about in the film. And another thing is Doug also touches on the whole restorative arts movement as well in it. And I also talk a little bit about that. And I'm, I'm shown doing some meeting club work and stuff in the movie. And that right there is another one of the big hitters, in my opinion, that we need to really dig deeper into nowadays to get people in better shape on a, on a whole different level than what they've been ingrained to believe at this point. Sure. Yeah. So that's kind of like the gist of it. So uh, wh where can they find the film? You can go to motivationmovie.com and there's a link on there for Real House, it's called. And you can just download it right from there and you can watch it on your smart TV or whatever. Excellent. Awesome, man. Um, that's a phenomenal project. I've, I've seen clips of that and stuff uh, over the last couple of years, so I'm definitely looking forward to, to checking that out at yeah. a certain point. Um, you know, uh, I think it was maybe it was Dr. Ed Thomas or maybe it was, yeah. but somebody's had that quote where it was, you know, to kind of to figure out where we need to go, we need to look back. You know, Right. Um, so I, I think that's so cool to, uh, see just the, the footage of, um, you know, that, that La Sierra high school and take a look at what they, they had going on there, um, from a physical culture standpoint and see the effect it had on the, the, the student body. Yeah. So that's really cool. Really cool. Yep. Look forward to checking that out and I'll make sure I include it in the, uh, in the show notes. So. Yeah. Now we get to move to the rapid fire. <laughs> okay. All right. So rapid fire questions here. We're going to start off from the top. So Kevin, given all of your knowledge and your experience, uh, if you go back in time, what advice would you give yourself 10 years ago? Um, don't be a sucker. <laughs> all right. Don't believe everything you see or hear. Hey. I was more impressionable 10 years ago than I am now. Develop a little bit of a critical eye for yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, if you had to pick one, what is your favorite uh, strength training or exercise that you like to do? 
I already mentioned it. Turkish get-ups, hands down. Nice. And I thought you were, I thought you were going to say, if you had to choose one, what's your favorite flavor of ice cream? <laughs> I thought you were going to throw me a weird curveball. Favorite flavor of ice cream. Oh, geez. I don't know. Um, probably chocolate peanut butter. Nice, man. Yum. Uh, <laughs> how has your training changed today compared to 10 years ago? Oh, wow. Night and day. 360 degrees. Um, I, I was still I, I was outside the box 10 years ago. Um, you know, I still tried to do like um, – intricate things and interesting things that were outside of the box with like lightweight dumbbells where the body was in leveraging in compromised positions and stuff. I started getting into it then, but I wasn't, I wasn't into the circular patterns or the figure eights or like the history of fitness. Then it all started making sense to me as time went on. And then, then when I looked back and said, Oh, 10 years ago, I was kind of already scratching the surface with this stuff. I was kind of in that direction, but I didn't really know why I was doing it then, but now I know the why. So basically I guess that's the best way of putting it. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, have you ever had an injury? And if so, how did that affect your training in your life? Yes. In 2005, I hurt my rotator cuff on my right side pretty badly in a kickball game, in a uh, dodgeball game. I'm sorry. Mind you, I am a, I am a dodgeball champion. And uh, back when I was in Pennsylvania. And the first season, I ran up to the line, I grabbed a ball, I ran back. We were playing a bunch of, against a bunch of kids that were like 18, 19 years old. And I fired a ball. It was really like the second throw of the game, the first game of the season. And I felt something tweak in my shoulder and I battled that injury the whole season. And it was, um, very, it was like, I couldn't even sleep on that side of my arm for like the whole summer, the whole entire time we played that season. And every day I'd have to like move my arm around the circles, circles, mind you, to get like blood flow going. And it was so tight and sore. It was unbelievable. I kept on working out. I kept lifting weights. And finally at the end of that season, I'm like, I don't know if I can come back next year because my shoulder's so jacked up. What I ended up doing was um, there was this naturopathic doctor named Dr. Decker Weiss who came out to Pennsylvania and he did a seminar locally at a store I used to um, frequent all the time. Everything natural was called. I attended a seminar. He was also a chiropractor and he went and he cracked someone in the crowd for some issue they had with their neck or something. I, after what I got talking to him, I told him about my injury and he recommended a couple supplements to me and he goes, I'd also do this. He goes, I would do um, downward facing dog three times a day, hold it for about 30 to 60 seconds. He goes, and really work on taking your hand and kind of corkscrewing it into the ground when you do it and pull your shoulder blade in as tight as you can, as tight as you can, you can handle and hold it there for 30 to 60 seconds. So I went and I did that. In about two and a half weeks, the pain was 50% gone. In about three weeks, I started throwing a ball again against the wall lightly because we had another season coming up. And then it, and after a month, my shoulder was about 90% better and I played kickball. I played uh, dodgeball again that year and it, it changed. And uh, something worked in that, you know, internal rotation in a downward dog, uh, downward facing dog position. And I was like, holy cow, that was like some voodoo stuff. So that was one of the times that my shoulder was injured. And another time it happened right before I started swinging Indian clubs, my shoulder was slightly injured, not as bad as it was then, but it was nagging for months and months and months. I learned how to use the Indian clubs, do basic patterns with them. And within literally in two weeks, it felt 100% better. And it's never been sore since. And we're talking like eight years now. Excellent, man. Yeah. Um, so you'll probably have a, a very interesting answer to this one, given your, your um, help on the um, motivation factor project. So what's one thing high school uh, athletes should be doing more of to complement their training and their health? Wow. It's hard to pare that down to just to narrow that down to just one thing. But I would say probably Indian clubs are going to be the number one thing. Kettlebells are a very close second. Mm -hmm. And the only reason I say Indian clubs is because they're, they're more user-friendly across all domains, regardless of your gender. If you're a female lacrosse standout or if you're a baseball player, basketball player, swimmer, whatever. Every one of those fields require your arms moving in some kind of circular motion or some kind of spiral. So... The Indian clubs are way less invasive than a kettlebell because they're a little bit ominous for some people to use because they are cast iron and they're not easy to cargo around places. Indian clubs, you get all the benefits you're ever going to need in your life with one pound Indian clubs and you can easily take them with you. You can travel with them. Lacrosse players should have them, absolutely have Indian clubs with them on all the time. Swimmers across the boards, they should travel with them. They should bring them with them. Baseball players, travel with them, bring them with them. Basketball players, football players, they should be on the sidelines. It should be part of their warm-up protocols. Every one of these sports should have every single athlete out there in unison 
just spinning those clubs. They should be on the sidelines, not sitting on those bikes, spinning their legs around. They should be there warming, their, keep their arms loose with those Indian clubs. If quarterbacks caught on, if I could just have five minutes with a pro team that would sit down and listen to me, I can change their game so fast it's not even funny. Their, their, bat, their batting would just improve. Their fielding would improve. Their throwing skills would improve so fast. And I'm talking like 30 seconds you can, you can get benefits. You know, because you, you kind of dabble with those, right? Yep. You know. So, I mean, 30 seconds spinning an Indian club is not asking that much. It's, it's low, you know, it's low pressure situation. And the benefits are so great that I, I would just say Indian clubs. Let's just bottom line it. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, best tip to improve recovery after a training session? Drink chocolate milk. Excellent. Eight, eight ounces. <laughs> What's your favorite meal? My favorite meal? Uh, I go to Whole Foods and I get this $10 meal deal. I'm going to give you two because I'm going to tell you the one that I buy and then the one that I make. So I go to t Whole Foods and I get a $10 meal deal, which is a hunk of salmon and two servings of kale Brussels sprout salad. Brussels sprouts and kale are cruciferous vegetables. Cruciferous vegetables are high in fiber, vitamin A and vitamin C and hydration. And cruciferous vegetables help your body naturally produce more testosterone, which translates to better workouts and more lean muscle mass. Bingo. At home, my favorite meal is steel cut oats with greens, protein powder, maca powder, cinnamon, and a little bit of coconut nectar blended. Yum. Booyah. Yeah. That sounds good. It is good. Uh, what's one book everyone should read? Uh, there's so many of those too. I would say The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle. Cool. Uh, who do you study or have you studied in your career to improve and get better? I have studied Dr. Ed Thomas. Um, I have studied um, Sim Kehoe, who was one of the founders of the Indian Club, the modern Indian Club movement in America, which was the 18, late 1800s. Um, I've studied Dr. Wayne Dyer, Eckhart Tolle. I'm big into like, you know, the, the brain and like, like the power of now and like, like earthy things too, not just necessarily fitness related stuff. Um, Bruce Lee is my, I would say he's probably like the biggest influence I've ever had in my life. So I've studied tons of stuff by him. I read a lot of his books, the books about him, um, the Jeet Kune Do stuff. I'm not a martial artist at all, but I respect the martial arts as much as I do the military and the forces. And his whole lifestyle and his, his, every fiber of his being is just like, it just brings so much motivation to me. It's not even funny. So those are some of the main people right there. Excellent. That's, that takes us through the rapid fire. Great. It was fun. Thanks for listening to the Leo Training Podcast. Subscribe and get even more expert training tips at www.leotraining.io.